Lord like Jesus can. Nobody can even compare to the goodness that Jesus in is in our lives. Hallelujah. And I pray that the Lord will prepare our hearts to receive what he has tonight. Prepare our hearts to be a sanctuary for his spirit. Lift our hands and sing it one more time. Lord, me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true, with your prayer tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated in his presence. What a joy it is to be back with you in the house of the Lord tonight. God is good on a Sunday night. Can you say amen for that? Amen. What a wonderful day we've had. It's a good day in the Lord this morning. And trust that you've had a good afternoon. I'm going to ask those that are going to the mission, going to go on the mission trip with us, if they will come. And I'm going to just have them stand before you. We're going to pray over each of them as a group and uh, let God Pray that God will have His will in, in their life this week. Just say, if you'll just pray softly for me and put that music there. And you guys will just come on up. Those that are going home to come on and just stand before this congregation. Hallelujah. Tomorrow we'll leave out early. I'm glad to be with us. And then Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night as we're ministering to children. Pray that God will strengthen us with us and give us strength to catch that all-nighter flight back to Orlando, amen, Anchorage, we're leaving tomorrow to Atlanta, and then to Seattle, and then to Anchorage, oh Lord Jesus, help us, and then after church Friday night, I said you've got about an hour to change clothes and pack, and we're headed for the airport, Friday night, 7 o'clock, 1030, somewhere around there, and we'll do it backwards, Anchorage to Seattle to Atlanta, and hope to be 
home at 4.30 in Orlando on Saturday afternoon. If we get delayed, we'll get here when we get here. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask if you will, would you stand across this congregation and stretch your hand this way and just ask the Lord to be with them this week, protect them and guide them, help them as they do what God's called them to do. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this team. Thank you, Lord, for those, Lord, as they've raised their money, as they've worked hard, and, Lord, they've sought your face, Lord. They have prayed and they have fasted and they have dedicated and rededicated their life to you. I pray, God, that you'll be with them tomorrow as they leave and guide them and direct them. God, give us travel and mercy. Father, I pray that you'll let us see fruit for our labor. God, that you'll touch the services. God, let us be touched and let us be revived. God, as we pour into the lives of students this week, God, I pray you'll bless us. God, let us go away just more encouraged and more challenged and and more dedicated and committed, God, to do the things that you've called us to do. Let us, Lord, do everything that's pleasing to you. And let us be sensitive, God, to the prompting of your spirit. God, I just pray that the kingdom of heaven will be enlarged this week. Lord, as we take this step and do what you've allowed us to do, what's been put before us, Lord, and we'll forever give you praise as you send us. Pray, God, that you'll give us travel and mercy there and back. We'll forever be thankful for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray tonight. And everybody said amen. And amen. So if you have your phone, if you'll come, and let's get one group picture before we leave. And that way, if you don't behave tomorrow, I have something that I can share with you. Squeeze close together, if you will. And uh, let's do that. Just play softly where it's not so close.
bring, brother, to you, God, and we ask that you'll move. God, I pray for this family that Brother Terry has mentioned, and Lord, the need from Sister Katrina. Lord, in every hand that was raised across this building, Lord, I know that you know the depth of it tonight. And I pray, God, that you'll move and minister. I pray, Lord, that you will lead and guide and direct. And, Lord, I believe in the power of prayer. God, and I believe we can call upon you. And, Lord, we can ask for your direction. And we can ask for your intervention. And we can ask for you to move, God. And we can plead our case. And I'm thankful for that tonight. Father, I pray that every hand that was raised, and Lord, some in this place, Sister Lily's request, touch Brother Rex tonight, God. Lord, continue to move in their lives. And Lord, I know that you're able. Touch Robin tonight, God. Lord, be with those that are in nursing homes, and Lord, those that are in rehab, even from our own church. And Lord, I know tonight that you're able, and I pray as we take this time corporately, and we call upon the name of the Lord, uh, that you will hear our cry. Lord, and that answers will be sent this hour, and that lives will be touched. And Lord, and that needs will be met. Lord, I love you today, and I thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, just pray, God, that you'll help us. Uh, pray, God, that you'll go with us. Uh, pray, God, that we'll do it not for our will, uh, and not our desire, and not for our accolades, uh, but that all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory can be given to you. Uh, we'll forever give you praise and honor and glory for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray tonight. That name that is above all names, we give you glory. In the name of Jesus, we ask. And, and everybody said, Amen and Amen. You again can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Tonight, I'm going to ask the ushers if they'll go ahead and prepare to wait upon you. Give you an opportunity to worship with your giving tonight. While they're getting ready, let me just mention our event tonight at the church. Um, usually the first Sunday night of the month is Journey Fellowship. We go off somewhere, but uh, they got in that kitchen today, I think, and made some more green beans and made some more banana pudding. And uh, we had some meat left over yesterday, and we knew we would. And we knew that before we started yesterday. And uh, so we said, well, let's just give that away on Sunday night. So uh, we're not going to charge you tonight. Uh, we're not going to have anybody at the cash box looking like you need to give some money. None of that tonight. I told them, I said, if you want to put a bowl up and walk away from it, you can do that. If you want to throw a dime
song of my heart. My voice is gone. It's just, I don't know. I'm sick of here somewhere this week. Uh, but uh, I have this song in my heart, and I want us to sing it. I'm going to look the page number up, but it's got one that says, I feel like traveling on. And uh, maybe, I don't know, I just feel like traveling on for Jesus. Amen? And let me look it up real quick. It's page 133. 133. I'm going to preach after this, but I'm going to sing first. And uh, I'm going to sing it out tonight. 133. Stand with me if you can. Hallelujah. They used to have Jericho marches or run those shirts on these songs like this. I don't know. I've just been feeling in my soul. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Nor pain nor death can enter there. I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. His glittering towers, the sun outshines. I feel like traveling on. That heavenly mansion shall be mine. I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. Oh, sing that chorus again tonight. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel. Anybody feel that tonight? Hallelujah. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Let others seek a home below. I feel like traveling on. Which flames devour or waves or flow. I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel. Well, my heavenly man, and there, lean on, the Lord has been so good to me, I feel like traveling on, until that blessed home I see, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. Oh, amen. Let's sing that third verse again. Let others seek a home below. I feel like traveling on. Which flames devour or waves or flow. I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I feel like traveling on. My heavenly home is bright and fair. Traveling. This last verse, one more time. The Lord has been so good to me. I feel like traveling on. Until that blessed home I see, I feel like traveling on. Oh, yes, I 
lifts our fields like traveling, traveling home. I feel like traveling home. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling home. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that tonight. Hallelujah. And I feel it in my soul. Amen. I believe we're closer than we realize. Can't give up now. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Take our text from there tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. If you'll remain standing for the reading of the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. One passage there that I'll let you have a seat. And I'll read out of Acts chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Hallelujah. First Corinthians chapter number 10. Hallelujah. Very familiar passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Can you say amen for that? God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation, doesn't say you won't have them, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. I can't make it, Pastor. Yes, you can if you'll let Jesus help you. Oh, Pastor, it's just too rough. I'm not going to survive this one. Yes, you will. You'll let Jesus help him. Read it again, then you can be seated. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now you may be seated while you're doing that. Acts chapter number 12. Acts chapter number 12. Verses 1 through 11. Acts chapter number 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him unto four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and an angel and, and, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. His chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. And when they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord had sent his angel and have delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people the Jews, taking those two verses that I've read, those two passages, putting them together, and the Holy Ghost helping me, I'm going to preach to us on this thought tonight, a very simple thought, there is a way out. Ooh, I'm thankful for that. I feel like traveling on, because I know there's going to be a way out of this. There is a way out. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the time we've had in your presence. Thank you for the reading of your word. I pray now that you'll anoint me one more time to deliver this that is before us, 
Well, I was to hear, Lord, if there's someone in this place that is burdened, that seems that the cares of life uh, have overtaken them. God, they're not sure what to do next. God, I believe you brought us by this pulpit tonight to encourage them in the word of the Lord and to encourage them uh, in their walk with you that no matter what it looks like, uh, there is a way out. Guide us, uh, help us, and direct us in this place tonight. And we'll forever give you praise and honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. And amen. Aren't you glad there is a way out tonight? Aren't you glad you don't have to stay in the same binds and the same prison and the same chains that you might have come into this place with? But with God, there is a way out. Now, our story picks up there in the New Testament with the, the, the individual of Peter. Peter had been thrown deep into the prison. The Bible gives us a reference that they had just killed someone else, and, and it was pleasing to the people. So they thought they would take Peter in and they would do the same with him. And Peter possibly thought that he would never see daylight again. See, he was in the inner prison, the deep, dark part of the prison. Satan was intimidating him. Satan was trying to get him off track. The enemy was trying to get him off the course that the Lord had for him. And the enemy does the same way with us. And Satan could not be more intimidating than he was in this particular time that Peter was being incarcerated. But even when it did not look good, there is always a way out. Can you say amen for that? I mean, you experienced that. There's always a way out. There's always something. There's always something that the Lord can do and will do for a way out. Now, if you'll go back with me in time, you will probably remember this story. Read about it again earlier. Uh, in Midland, Texas, a young girl, a little girl who fell into the old and forgotten well near her home. Does anybody remember this story? She was there. The world was captivated by her story, and they watched as teams of brave workers attempted to rescue her. And if, if it goes the way that I remember and the way this recording had it, there was a new tunnel that was dug, and, and another passageway was prepared so someone could crawl down into the earth and retrieve her. And it seemed as if the world sighed with relief when little Jessica McClure was brought out of the earth's depths and the darkness that she once was in was no longer entrapping her. And I remember, it's been several years ago now, but I remember kind of watching that on the news, and, and I thought, what did she feel like? And what did her family feel like? And what did the authorities around her feel like uh, when it looked from the outside, uh, from just a 50,000-foot level looking down, uh, that there was no way out for this girl? Well, somehow that well had been forgotten. Somehow it, it, it had not been marked or properly closed or properly uh, preserved and it was a trap for her, and she found herself in that, and it looked like there was no way out. And I thought, look, what would I do if, if they called and said, what have my babies had done? I mean, I, I, would, I would just be uh, beside myself, and you would too. Somebody you love was trapped, couldn't get out. But spiritually speaking, that's exactly what the enemy's trying to do to us. Trying to put us in a inner cell, trying to put us in a deep, dark dungeon where it seems we will never see daylight again. But just as there was a way out for Jessica, there's a way out for you. Oh, Pastor, give me some Bible. I don't want to hear a secular story. I'm glad you mentioned it. Joseph. You remember Joseph? Old Testament? Joseph's brothers threw him into a deep pit and walked away, leaving him there to starve to death. But God, but by divine providence, there just so happened to be some traders on their way to Egypt. They came by, they lifted him out, and they put Joseph on his road to destiny. And we know the Bible story about how Joseph was there, and things good and bad both happened to Joseph, but all of it was part of God's plan because later there would be a famine in the land, and Joseph would single actively be able to take care of his family because of the favor he received from God. But I can tell you when Joseph was in the pit and when Joseph had been uh, left there by his family, I'm sure he wasn't thinking about being a king or being a prince or being one in power that could save his family. But he did have a dream and he knew that God had given it to him and he knew that with God there had to be a way out 
and I'd say, Lord, I don't know who we're preaching to on Sunday night. It might be for me tomorrow. It might be for you tonight. But it does not matter how deep the pit of life may be that you're in. I've come by a pulpit to tell you tonight there is a way out with our Lord Jesus. There is a way out as long as he's God. And it does not matter what the enemy has set out to do to you. If you'll hold on to him and you'll realize the tactics and you'll put your faith and your trust in Jesus tonight, there is always a way out. Hallelujah. Pastor, I can't handle it. You can't, but Jesus can. Pastor, it's too big for me. It might be, but it ain't too big for Jesus, my friend. Let's look at Peter. We read that out of the New Testament tonight about Peter. Let's look at Peter tonight. Number one, there was a reinforcing crowd. Peter was surrounded uh, by what the King James says, a, a, a group of soldiers, four quaternions of soldiers, 16 men um, that were assigned to keep watch of this disciple of the Lord. Now, he must have been a little big threat, but it took 16 folks uh, to keep watch over him, 16 folks uh, to make sure that he didn't escape. They already had him in the inner prison. And we realized later by reading the scripture that he had to walk through a couple different gates to even get to the main gate. So it wasn't like he was in a room right next to the daylight. He was deep down, stuck somewhere, and he had 16 men there. He was bound to some of them. 16 men were assigned to make sure he did not depart. And this is one of the enemy scare tactics that he uses. He tries to intimidate us. He tries to surround us. He tries to get our mind off of Christ and on the things of the world. He tries to get our mind off of the blessings and the promises of God and on our situation and our worry and all of those things. And I said, Lord, I don't know exactly what Peter was feeling that night, but if I had 16 men watching me and I knew that my friend had recently been beheaded or killed and I knew that my time was drawing nigh, I would wonder where Jesus was at at that midnight hour. And I said, Lord, there are people that I know that are facing difficulties in their life and they may have wondered if Jesus was there they may have wondered if Jesus knew about it they may have wondered if it was possible can I tell you tonight regardless of what the crowd around you looks like there is still a way out and you need not be concerned one of Satan's scare tactics let me take you back to the Old Testament just for a moment you remember the Syrian army that surrounded Elisha and his servant there in Dothan? It seemed that these two men were surrounded by hundreds. It seemed as if the odds were against them. It seemed as if there was no hope. God opened the servant's eyes to see not only the truth, but also to see the revelation. We read this in 2 Kings chapter 6. You can read the details later. But the revelation in 2 Kings 6 and 16 was this. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now there's the man of God and his servant. They are surrounded by some folk. Call it what you want. And the servant is concerned. And that man of God, because he can see what is there, thank God for the Holy Ghost, amen, says, hey, those that are with us are more than those that are with them. Now, for somebody tonight, you need to get a hold of this. You need to realize it does not what you see. If God be for us, who can be against us? Listen to me. Paul declared that in Romans 8.31. We need to realize that though I may not physically be able to see those things that I really would like to see, I would like to know, God, if I was in these people's predicament that there was more, I want to see them and I want to know. But God simply sometimes just reminds us that if He is for us, who can be against us? And it does not matter what the crowd is saying. You can realize tonight that there is always going to be You study this out with our, our text with Peter. And you realize that these soldiers were around him and guarding him. I can imagine it being 16 people, Pastor Rich would say, guarding someone like Austin. I don't know. That was, it preaches this. I 
guarantee you they didn't send a wimpy servant to keep track of this man. They wanted to make sure he didn't go anywhere. And it seems at times in our life that we face a bigger battle than our neighbor does. We face all the giants and the burdens and the load that we carry must be larger than what Pastor Richie or Pastor Adams or, or Pastor Hanks carries because now I just don't know if I, can I tell you it doesn't matter how big they are. If you'll realize that Jesus is still on the throne, if you'll realize that he's still able, there is always, there is always a way out, even in the midst of adversity. And so we, we, we go from this reinforcing crowd, these folks that are ensuring that he does not leave, to point number two. There is a word, there is a word in our text that's very important, and we've called it for point number two tonight, the rearranging conjunction. Welcome back to English. Okay? A conjunction is a vocabulary mechanism that connects sentences together. And the second sentence changes the intentions of the first sentence. Now let me let me help you with this. In our text, there's a phrase in that verse that we read that says, but prayer was made. Okay? Now hold that thought. Go back to the Old Testament with me. God was ready to destroy all of mankind. Remember this? The flood. He had he had he was disgusted with man, was sorry that he ever made man. But there's a, 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 a phrase there, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's a very important word. Going back to Joseph. Joseph was doomed to, to, to just wipe away there in prison, but he found favor with the keeper of the prison. That word but is a, is a conjunction that rearranges the, the intention of the first sentence and makes it different. Thank God for a rearranging conjunction. Now let me bring it up, up to you tonight. You were sick, but God. Okay? And you fill in the blank. You were lost. Oh, I was lost. You were lost, but God made a way of escape a way of salvation, a, a plan of redemption. We were dying. You go back to this morning, right? We were full of sin-sick leprosy. We had a disease on us. We were an outcast. And my three lepers did a poor job this morning hollering, unclean, unclean. Somebody, I had two pieces of advice this morning after I preached. Somebody said, you should have got a needle and poked them. I guarantee you they'd have hollered something then. That was the mother of one of the boys. Another person says, if you'd have got some girls up there, they'd have made some noise for you. And that's probably true, too. But we were all, we were all overwhelmed with this sin, sick life, disease, on our way to hell. But God made a way of escape. So we got to realize that in the middle of, of Peter's prison, in the middle of our sinful life, in the middle of our circumstances, in the middle of our adversities and trials and tribulations and, and, and even joys and sorrows and all those things that we face, we must realize that Jesus is that light and Jesus can shine into the prison that we are in and there is no limit for the light of God. God's light can reach wherever you are at. But you don't understand sometimes. I've been carrying this load and it seems that that the more I pray, the more I struggle, and the, and the more I want to, the more I can't. Oh, I've been there. When it seems that all you do is go from one day to the other, and you haven't committed an open sin, you, you don't have ill will against your brother, you, you're doing what God's called you to do, you, you know you're in, in the peace of God, resting in His safety and in His comfort, but it seems that just, it just seems that you're just in a prison, you're trapped, and you're in a dungeon, and I said, Lord, why is it? And I didn't explain all that to you, but I've come to the realization that it does not matter how deep and how dark the prison of my life may be, there is still a God that promises me a way out. There is still a God that's able. And if I don't get it on this side of glory, I will get it when he comes again. There's always a way out. There's always a way out. I shared with you this morning, I love when I preach AM and PM because I can connect it all together. And if you miss Sunday morning, I'm sorry. you got to go back and buy the CD. I'll share with you this morning about some of the opportunities we had with our 
our transportation modes this week. I called mom today, and um, I said, anything going on? That's usually how we start, you know. Oh, I got a lot to tell you about. And they said, oh, great. What is this going to be like? She says, and it's all to do with our vehicles. And I went, really? <laughs> me too. We haven't talked since, I think, last Sunday or Saturday. And I said, uh, me too. She said, what's going on with yours? So I shared briefly with her. Told her I got two of the three fixed, and Terry, she's going to have to wait till I get back from the lounge. <laughs> and she began to tell me about her little stuff. One said this, and one said that. And I thought, now isn't that ironic? You know, we're 130 miles away, whether we were 100 miles or 1,000 miles, didn't matter. But you know, she faces the same things there that we face here. You face the same things in your family that I face there. And, and she didn't one time blame the devil for any of it. I mentioned that this morning. She didn't one time blame the devil for any of it. She says it is, you know, kind of what it is. But it was ironic. She went to my brother's house, and every time she drove there, when she went to leave, it wouldn't crank. Two different vehicles came to open. I said, well, there's your problem right there. It's my brother. <laughs> He's been the problem for a long time, if you ask me. No matter what you're facing, there's this three-letter conjunction, this three-letter word, this word called but that changes the intent of the first sentence to something else. The devil is out to destroy you, but God has a plan. The devil is out to steal, to kill, to rob, and all of those things, but God has a plan. The enemy is trying to make you feel overwhelmed, and you can't keep up, and you're losing your mind, and you're not going to, whatever it is, but God God is telling us tonight through his word that there is still a way out on a Sunday night. The first Sunday night of May. Listen, listen. That light of God can reach down to the deepest, darkest spot of your life. And where you think there's no way, when you think there's no help, when you think there's no alternative, I can tell you of a truth tonight, God is still able. Number three. Reinforcing crowd. Number two, rearranging conjunction. Number three, go ahead. A restful confidence. Stay with me. Peter slept through most of this ordeal. I want you to follow it closely. He, he, he slept through most of this. Now, I, I remember laying down early this morning, about when it was. I remembered, I think it was last night or this morning. Yeah, I remember, not before, turning on a, a, a CD. It's on my phone, but a CD to play. It had eight songs on it, 38 minutes to music. I don't remember the first song start ending much. I don't remember it starting much. But I remember the first song ending. So in about three to four minutes, I was gone and slept well. We find Peter in this passage that the angel, when the angel, I mean, he's fixing to die. Some of us would be a worried fit by now. We have chains on us. We've got 16 folk. We're inside of a couple different wards, if you will, or cells, and and, and we find that Peter is, is sleepy. You travel with me tomorrow. I'm not, I'm not going to promise you I won't sleep on the plane. And I'll do my very best that I won't go with you. I'm not going to promise that. <laughs> Peter is sleepy. How did Peter sleep through a circumstance like this? What was it in Peter's life that allowed him to rest or to sleep in a time like this? Well, maybe it was because he had seen Jesus sleep through a storm before. Maybe. You remember when they were on the boat together to the other side? The storm came up. Jesus was sleeping. And uh, they had to go wake him up and say, do you not care that, you know, that we're about to die here? Okay. So Peter had seen that and maybe that helped build some faith and confidence in, in the situation that I'm going to go to sleep and it's going to be what it's going to be. And I'll trust the Lord. Or, or could it have been the, the promise that 
Jesus had given to Peter. I'm just giving you some options. A promise that Jesus had given Peter in John 21, 18, when he said to Peter, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whether thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hand, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. John 21, 18. But could it be that Peter could sleep through this time because he had received a promise from the Lord that he was going to grow old? And, and the Scripture tells us that. The Scripture furthermore declares for us in Isaiah 26 and 3 that thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee or trusted in the Lord. So I begin to think about Peter and this this situation that he's in. We would call it a predicament. I mean, he's, he's got it bad. He is in prison. He's in the inner prison. He's being guarded by several folks. He has chains on his body. He is there sleeping. He's about to die in the coming hours, days, if not for hours, really. And an angel shows up and wakes him and says, get dressed, get up, let's go. And the Bible plainly tells us that Peter thought it was a vision. Peter thought he was dreaming. Peter thought he was seeing something and did not know until they went through the first ward and the second ward and came to the iron gate which led to the city according to the scripture and went down we went through one street and then the angel disappeared and then Peter realized that God had surely showed up and made a way where there seemeth to be no way and I said if God will do it for Peter and God did it for Noah. And God did it for Joseph. Why can't God do it for some of us in Okoye? I mean, just call me crazy. I've been called that before. But if I really believe the Word of God is true, then I must realize that no matter what I face, good, bad, or indifferent, there is always a way out. Always. Always. When they don't, the cars don't crank, there's a way out. When the children are aggravating, there's a way out. When life seems to crumble in around us, there's a way out. When it seems that all hell is a-spelling you, there is a way out. When it seems that everything you touch just crumbles before you, there is still a way out. When it seems your prayers hit the roof and bounce back time and time and time again, there is still a way out. When it seems you've done everything that you know to do and all you've got left is to trust the Lord, can I tell you there is still a way out. When it seems you don't know why people do this or, or why people do that, why people say this, or, or why people just give it to God and trust Him that there is a way out. Don't fix it. Oh, that's, that's for you, preacher. Don't fix it. But God. Don't fix it, Pastor Charles. If there's one thing I've learned in almost seven years as your pastor, there's just some things you don't fix. You ain't God, and you let God deal with it. Because if you get involved in it, it's going to be a bigger mess than it is in hell. That takes time, and that takes wisdom, and that takes some gray hairs, and things of that nature, but I can't fix it. i got to trust the Lord. I've got to be led by His Spirit and prompted and do as He said. But I've got to realize they're not serving the church. They're not serving the pastor. They're not serving the church family. They're supposed to be serving God. And if they won't do what's right for God, they're not going to do it for me or anybody else. It's a good place to say amen. There's a way out. That crowd forces their way in. Forces. Tries to prevent us doing what's right. I mentioned this morning, I don't use this platform for political memes, and I say that very seriously. But I do get concerned when it seems even in our local area where we're at, that there is an attack on Christianity. There's an attack on Bible reading. There's an attack on 
being moral and being right, and it just it just frustrates me to the point that it, it really makes me at times not even want to go and fellowship or associate or or any of that because because I know going into those kind of settings that they don't agree with what I what I believe is the word of God, so we're already at a disconnect. And so, but but I've had to to realize that in that. I can't just sit by and say, well, God, if they don't know, it ain't my fault. No, I, I have to realize that with everything I face, there is always something good that can come out of it. But if God be for us, who can be against us? So I've kind of taken this approach that it doesn't matter what I'm facing. There's going to be a way out. It doesn't matter how deep the valley is. Now, God hears me. I don't like them. I don't like valleys. I don't like them deep. I don't like ones that are long. I mean, if it was my way, we, we would just spend a month in top all the time. But I'm almost 40 years old. It don't happen that way. There are some times in our life that God gets us in those, allows those things to come our way where we can grow. And through those times of growing, I have to remember that everybody has a me because God said he would never forsake me. Everybody hasn't given up on me because God gave his life that we might have life. So I have to realize when it seems that everything around me looks bad, there is this three-letter word called but that rearranges everything else before it because Jesus said, I am with you always. Jesus allowed me to understand through his word that with every temptation there will be a way of escape. Jesus allowed me to understand that he will go prepare a place for me, and if he is gone, he will come again. So I have to realize that no matter where I'm at, there is a way out of this. And we can apply this to any situation in our lives, spiritually, financially. I mean, so deep packed that I can't see bottom. There is a way out. You might not want to do it, but there's a way out. I, I'm at the point, I guess we come up on a list every so often. I go home and check them out. And there's three or four, I mean, sometimes in the same day. But in a week or two, I'll get three and four and five a week of credit card this and credit card that. First thing I do is open them and look at the fee on the back of it and how much interest they want to charge you. And they're usually giving you a promotion for like a month or six months or a year. And I'm thinking, you ain't sucking me into that one. Tear that thing up and throw it away. And if it comes with Sister Wendy's name on it, I check her mail too. I throw hers away as well. Spiritually, financially, that is to give the kids. Hey, there's no way out. You do what you won't survive. It's just going to blow apart. There's a way out. There's a way out. You feel like with your job, I, I was talking to someone yesterday that, uh, on, on computers that I, I worked with. Uh, she worked for me. Uh, I was her manager when I worked in healthcare care umpteen years ago. And uh, I saw something that led me to believe she was no longer employed there. So I reached out to her and said, what is going on? And she said, after 13 years, I was laid off from a job. Crumbling. A young, a young girl. She's younger than I am, has one or two children, been there. I said, she's been there since she was a teenager in 13 years, and she's gone. And you could say, well, she probably did to deserve it. She may have. I don't know who said. Regardless, she's trapped. And the devil will tell her there's no way you're going to survive. But for her and for me tonight, there is a way out. Regardless of the year. Would you stand? Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for the word of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that the promises that you've given us are forever and ever and everlasting. Father, I thank you tonight that there is a way out. Lord, when it seemed that your disciple, that your servant was doomed, when it seemed that life was about to end, Lord, you sent an angel, Lord, to take care of the situation and to lead him out to safer grounds. God, if you'll do it for that disciple, you'll do it for disciples in this place that love you and are called according to your purpose. Lord, I don't know what everyone faces, and I don't know really the details or how 
how bad it really is in their life. I don't know what the enemy has told them. I don't know what lies and what intimidation he's tried to put up their way. But one thing I do know, it does not matter what is before the word but. After the word but, I see things that says God is with me and God is for me. And I shall not be moved. I see those things that remind me that if I fully commit my life to you, there is a way out because you are a holy God. And Lord, in this altar tonight, Lord, if it be just one, I pray that somebody will get a hold of this understanding that no matter what they're facing, there is a way out. I'm reminded of the Word of God, but prayer was made. Prayer was made for Peter. And Lord, tonight we're going to follow that example. And we're going to come. And we're going to seek your face. And we're going to pray. And God, if there's individuals in this place tonight that need a way out, they're going to have to, Lord, seek your face. I can't do it for them. It's going to have to be their decision. But Lord, if they'll do it, I'm depending upon your word to be alive in their life. And if and to show them that with you all things are still possible. Lead them, guide them, and direct them in this altar. And we'll forever give you praise and honor and glory for it. In the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said amen. Nobody moving. Here's our altar call. You're in a situation. You're in a something. And you need a way out. Won't you come bring it to God tonight? It could be any circumstance at all in your life. But tonight something has put a core with you and you say that's me and I need a way out I need God to move I need God to show up if that's you tonight would you come and join me in this altar and let's spend a few moments crying out to him let's spend a few moments making a prayer unto the Lord let's spend a few moments saying God here I am and I believe that you're able I want to have one of those uh, but God situations in my life would you come and cry out to him tonight would you come and call up on his name tonight. Would you come and let him speak to you from the back all the way to the front. Let's come and call upon the name of the Lord. Let's come and call upon the name of the Lord tonight. Help us tonight, I pray, God. Help us tonight, I pray, sweet Jesus. Help us tonight, I pray, but God, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you tonight. Lord, I need you tonight. Help us in this place tonight, I pray, God.
God, that you're there. Thankful, God, that when the enemy and the world tells us there's no way out, and the world tells us we have to go the way of the world, reminded tonight that there's always a way. God, because Jesus is able to make the way. Thank you, Lord, for being with us tonight. Lord, thank you for this congregation that loves you, worships together. Lord, thank you, Lord, for the family of God. Go with us tonight, I pray. Bless the food that's been prepared. Let us just fellowship again, God, together. Around the table, thanking you for all the wonderful things you've done for us. We'll forever be grateful for it tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody say amen.